my name is Adam Nathaniel Thurman. I'm an artist and designer from an architectural uh, background, meaning that <clears throat> I initially studied um, at Central St. Martins, um, like foundation course, um, and then moved into architecture. I studied that, worked in architecture for OMA, uh, Ron Arad Architect, um, Terry Farrell, Ash Sackula, various places, um, and taught in architecture as well. But but uh, ran a mile away from from part three because uh, it was um, it was very much not not me um, and I my practice has sort of been um, it's one of those is you know sort of multidisciplinary practices but I don't particularly see it that way I just do the work that I enjoy which happens to just be at different scales um, different mediums uh, publishing spoons and, and there's a kind of a strong element that runs through all of this where i'm very very interested in material culture and aesthetics as embodying identity and for me it like comes from a very personal background of just not fitting in basically i'm always at the borders between things from just by birth and then just by proclivity um, and so identity in relation to like how people who don't fit into any identity groups who are constantly between people of mixed heritage, but then also people who are queer and of different uh, gender identities, uh, which kind of straggle different boundaries, how that is expressed, how they can be expressed in the visual and material culture of architecture and design, which is something that was sort of, you know, left me being deeply ridiculed for many years, but has bizarrely sort of started to be taken a little bit seriously by some people in recent years. And the book has very much been a focus, a passion focus for me, because it's in many ways a sort of gifting to the next generation of like something that I felt I really lacked and that I could have uh, very much used <laughs> when I was going through architectural education. My name is Adam Kauza. I'm a senior tutor at the Royal College of Art, and I work right now in contemporary art practice here. Um, previously, I was working in the School of Architecture for about seven years, and so my work kind of straddles between architecture, arts, the humanities, um, and I've been I've been really interested for a long time in questions of culture in the city, questions of inequalities in the city, um, and that's come through a few different projects. the The largest one that I kind of co-founded back in 2012 was called Teatro Mundi. And this is a project that really tried to bring together experts from the built environment with experts from theater design, from choreography, from visual arts, to talk about ways of making cities, of making public in the city, and of shifting some of the technocratic ways in which city discourse around smart cities and other elements like that were moving. Um, and to try to bring expertise from the way people made space in performance and made space in visual art and practice. A lot of my own work now uh, works on questions of emotional geography. So I'm writing a book right now on queer loss and trying to think about um, the ways in which loss as a structure, grief as a structure is both one that um, is coupled with queer life, but also productive um, in a lot of ways. Um, so that's that's one thing I'm thinking about at the moment. Um, and the other project is around critical dialogue. So really thinking around the history and present of the spatial organization of dialogue, um, of discourse, and trying to think about the ways in which we produce that in space, but also in digital life. And that's one of the exciting things that's in your book, you can come to in a second, is you know the multitude of scales, sites, and spaces where queer life, dialogue, emergence, pleasure happens. So, I mean, the book is hugely, hugely meaningful on a, on a, on a personal level. It's kind of, um, I think possibly, it feels like the possibly the, mo the most important like thing from for myself personally that I've been lucky enough to be involved with so far in my career. Um, in, and it's it sort of, feels that way because it's a little bit like looking back at my past and it's precisely the thing that I feel would have filled a gap that was missing when I was going uh, through university, um, which was in a way a little, a bit, little bit like an extension of what I was experiencing, what I had experienced um, in high school and in sort of like wider society prior to that so just, a, I guess, a little bit of context. I grew up in 
mean, the 80s when I was very young and then 90s London, um, which was something that for um, a sort of young gay or queer kid was very much coloured by obviously the AIDS <clears throat> pandemic epidemic, but also by um, Section 28, which was um, homophobic legislation that was put in to the statute book in 1987 by Thatcher's government, a populist move uh, that superficially sounded reasonable uh, to their base, um, but actually ended up creating a very uh, aggressively unhelpful environment for young uh, gay uh, and queer people. I was effectively saved by, um, I guess, some really fantastic subcultures in the city. Uh, not in fact, not all of them gay. Some of them, some of them, sort of gay friendly, like uh, or actually more queer friendly than gay friendly. Like the the sort of new punk scene that was happening in the late nineties mm. uh, around Camden. But then also, um, you know, there's really important local bits of queer infrastructure, the local gay pub, and that's where I studied A levels. So I, I've you know found the Black Cap and then sort of found Soho, and so uh, discovered this world of people who were sort of very politically active, uh, ac active in terms of healthcare and like fighting for access uh, and removing stigmas, um, politically pushing for Section 28 to be removed, but also very joyous, like viciously proud, uh, sometimes economically very successful. And they were creating a very vibrant scene of nightclubs, restaurants, bars, cafes, just all kinds of things in the scene, which was very aesthetic in the sense that their existence was being constantly embodied through, yes, okay, there was protest art, but there was lots of other stuff going on. And like, I remember being involved in the creation of graphics for like a nightclub, which uh, is like, like, you know, these things were happening constantly. Um, and then I went to architecture school and it was sort of like going back to, you know, back to high school, but without the physical abuse, but it was very much being othered constantly. After all of these years of kind of like basically feeling really isolated and like sort of somewhat, um, attacked but then also knowing perfectly well that there's an incredible history out there but also contemporary life which is very recognized in parallel fields like fine arts and literature um that something that was accessible for students that wasn't like i mean there was there was history and theory stuff you know there's um books um about queering space there's books about sexuality and space and gender um but for a dyslexic design student which is over 50 percent of design students by the way, um, who are not stupid, but don't know how to translate very dense texts that are, you know, in sort of impenetrable postmodern prose into the design work, giving them something that was a canon that's easily, easily accessible, that gives them a broad range of the types of themes, strategies, methodologies, approaches, aesthetics, like everything, at least a few examples of them with lots of amazing writers that, that could then be a, like a gateway drug for their gayness or <laughs> their queerness, um, that they could just use to not be laughed out the room was, I mean, I cannot express how important that was. And it just drove me like all the way through the project, which by the way, is a giant collaborative project. Like I might've initiated it, but it's a huge community project. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's sort of like why I like with the reasoning behind it. Um, it's sort of very personal thing. And Josh, who's unfortunately not here, also has his own personal reasons. And a lot of people who've read it have got really emotional. Like we've had people sort of burst into tears since some of the openings because they feel seen or they feel like this is something that they can't believe. Uh, Alice Powers, fantastic curator at the VNA, was saying she could not believe that this book <laughs> didn't exist before. Like it's shocking that it's 2022 yeah. and it didn't exist. I mean, it's one of these books that I think you know, it, it has a life in, in, in design spaces, it'll have a life in academia, it'll have a life in kind of the profession, but it's also a really public book because I mean, the book shows they're, they're, they're hidden, they can be uh, places of retreat, they can be domestic, they can be kind of common, but they're also out in public and they're, they're, they're of a public. And just, I mean, just yesterday I, I had it, I was doing some commuting. And so I was just, you know, flipping through and reading. And I've never had this with any other book I've ever read in my life. Um, but this person at the, the coffee shop, I wasn't even close to them. And they yelled across the train cor concourse and said, oh my gosh, what a great book. And I just thought, wow, the, all they saw was the title. They just saw kind of queer spaces. They just saw it's kind of design and they, they made that kind of connection. So not only that, and that's, I mean, just moving into kind of some of the things I'm taking away from it. One of them is having read queer spaces and, and come to know your work, Adam, and also Joshua, Mardell's, but also, you know, you flip to the back of this book 
and you see the list of contributors and all of a sudden it's like you're at a party. <laughs> it's like you're at a club. It's like you're somewhere meeting people you didn't know, but you have some affinity with people you want to get to know. And so, yes, it's, it's a document. It's an, it's an atlas. It's a, it's a, it's a reference. It's a resource. You know, it's a thing in the world. It's legitimacy. Um, it's care, it's attention, but it's also what I think so many of the spaces also do, which is um, it's, it's a network. Um, it's a queer family in a, in a sense. Um, and I mean, in some real ways, it can be a lifeline, you know, real lifeline or, you know, a pedagogic, uh, a discursive, a design lifeline for people who might uh, have, have felt, have been um, uh, isolated or um, attacked or, you know, marginalized in lots of ways. I ju it just like brought a smile to my face. Um, for all the reasons you've said, but also for those very personal, you know, autoethnographic uh, stories that all of us have um, as, as queer people in the world of migration, of isolation, of finding spaces um, that then now one can see kind of mirrored and recognizable even through their, you know, great difference and, and, you know, radical difference across the world. Um, but a sense or an atmosphere or something, you know, whether that's kind of safety or familiarity or just um, intimacy, pleasure, or just peace, you know, um, seeing some of these frenetic, you know, like friends frenzy. This is one of the bars. It's called, quote, tagline is rainbow heaven. And, you know, for some that might give them a kind of sense of, of shock or like, you know, their heartbeat. And I just felt at peace with the radical aesthetics of this place, because it felt familiar, I felt like it would be a place that, that might be safe, that might be home. You know, you offer us this book, which is something you can just open anywhere. Um, you can read it front to back. It's got, you know, the domestic, the common, the public, it has a kind of structure. Um, but, you know, if you, even if you flip through it that way, you're jumping between the 17th century in England or Europe, and then a rooftop in, uh, in you know, in a rooftop bar in Tokyo, or you know, um, the, the Friends Frenzy that I mentioned, or the Hydra Guruma's house, or you know, you've got all these things that even if you try to go through it in a in a in a straightforward way, it's still kind of clearing that that sense of history or or that sense of geography, which is is beautiful. But you start with one and you end with one that I think offers this beautiful bookend also to some of the kind of personal histories. You start with train journey, the photographs of a singular person, you know, and a story about having to pass, having to this constant question for queer people of safety, of authenticity, um, and of just survival. So this question of passing and your kind of gender identity comes through here, you know, being able to um, purchase, I'm quoting here, went online and purchased my first pair of tits uh, in the summer of 2017, being able to, for the first time, experiment and think about their gender identity through, through other means and then going home and having to pass in other ways. And, and so much of that is, is a kind of personal journey of kind of safety, of geography, um, of our own identity. And then you end, you end, <laughs> It's this beautiful explosion of comparsa drag in Buenos Aires, where, and I just want to quote a beautiful sentence here. So we move from this individual on a train trying to decide their safety if they can pass. And here we have comparsa drag who've been dragging streets since 2018. They've developed several ways of inhabiting public space as a diverse flock. They move as a vagrant pack, wandering at queer speeds, under queer time. And here's what I love. They talk about the redistribution of pleasure as a statement against violence and work. And the images here are of groups, masses in public, um, offering us these kind of beautiful language of queer wandering and a redistribution of pleasure. And I thought, what a beautiful way to kind of bring us into and leave us with these kind of two different images um, of, of, of queer life. And I just, I, that has to have been intentional, but I wondered if you might just say a, a, a little bit about it. 
well, it's just very yeah it's it's nice to have these things being picked up as a positive right <laughs> Uh, it, yeah it was very intentional um the book ends and it's, it's lovely that that you do feel that it resonated um you know it was it's it, so we wanted to show that, that this was the whole book was meant to be recognized we we didn't want to ignore difficulties at all but we really wanted to be make the whole thing a celebration of resilience of beauty in the face of adversity of joy um, of strategies to be human, of making families, of making our marks in the world. Um, and to do that, we had to sort of just throw out the usual categories of, you know, so we've had a lot of people saying like, well, how do you design queer architecture? Where's the queer architecture? You know, and I think the in the Financial Times, they sort of said, oh yeah, and it's, I, they have a very open definition. I mean, you could almost just think of being queer and it, the space will be queer. And, you know, it can be seen that way, but at the, at the same time, coming at it from a quiz perspective, it opens up uh, notions of what can constitute architecture and what can constitute interesting space that's worthy of recognition and uh, and uh, notation or marking down as being important to history. And yeah, we want, so we just thought that those two were a really good way to let people in, in a very kind of extremely personal, small scale manner to show how possibly something which is as far away as one can get maybe in the whole book from an unusual understanding of what like queer space might be as a nightclub or an interior design or a you know a house for us or you know older gay man you know but at the same time it's impossible not to recognize that that space because of how it's beautifully written by Ilo on that train of putting on her boobs of put, of sort of reaffirming her actual gender as she's moving away from Premier Del Mar, this place which is more conservative where she's not out, that you you really feel it. It's 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 if you're an empathic human being, which frankly everyone who's reading the book will be, you cannot but understand how precious that moment is and how beautiful it is. So that was us to sort of it's sort of like a cold, it's sort of like a the the ice bucket challenge it's just sort of like dropping the ice bucket on people as they they start the book a palette cleanser sort of in, entering you into the space is putting on the gay vr headset as it were and then ending um <laughs> and ending um similarly but with a sort of you know like when you're pushed down from the top of the scary slide in the water park. Um, we, we, we wanted the drag to be like that. It's just like pushing you back into the real world. But like, you know, saying the real world is actually possibly amazing. And like, take it, grab it, you know, bring pleasure to every corner of the city, you know, mess up those boring government sponsored parades <laughs> uh, and those streets that are supposedly too dangerous for any bourgeois to walk down them um and so it was very much a sort of like this is the city but this is how it can be queer this is how it can be seen this is how brilliant it can be this is happening now really enjoyed the setting out of the spaces because we kind of we kind of purposefully called it an atlas as you might under, as you might imagine purposefully to take the idea of an atlas and you know up as it were you know sort of <laughs> an atlas is all about the sort of geometric dispensation of, of analyzed or measured space where Ooh. everything is equal somehow and everything there's a sort of objective eye you know it's like the Linnaean grid this is, that, that sort of indexes all species you know with clear boundaries which is ridiculous because species are gradients um and we we took that idea of an atlas, which is a very colonial uh, kind of notion of mapping the world, and we wanted to take the take it and turn it into something that was actually all about creating relationships. <clears throat> so it's quite as a as a queer person, like I found it very isolating in architecture because it's very difficult to find other people who are sort of very open and active about being queer in their work. But just generally for us, it's quite hard because we don't have an ethnic group, we don't have a community, we're not born into a society or a social group that has its own history. So there's marginalization, but then you can have your own culture and you can have your own history. You work as a group, but then, you know, that every generation is some very often, unfortunately, like starting again. Um, and in architecture, sort of this idea of creating a lineage and a family. So you, one doesn't have to totally start from scratch. Uh, for people who do think spatially, for people who live in the real world, for people who don't live in theory lab, um, you know, and that was 
very important. And it's why we wanted to create these juxtapositions where from the, you know, you have a two up, two down house for a working class man in Sheffield uh, from the, I don't know, sort of 1940s. And then uh, next page, you have, uh, you know, a, three humongous castles in Bavaria from a 19th century uh, monarch. Um, and then page after that, you know, you can have uh, a house in the countryside outside Tokyo from the 90s for uh, an artist and a, and a barber. Um, and, and they all sort of come together as a family to show how across space and time there are connections rather than trying to, and, you know, we have a lot of criticism that we don't define what queerness is or queer space is, but actually what we're trying to do is we're trying to do that by bringing together a group who together communally as a sort of cloud define what that is. So those doctors' positions were really important because it was literally like bringing people into a room <laughs> like through these spaces. No, totally. I, there's, there's something so beautiful about that method because I think also in the introduction, in your editor's introduction, you also speak about um, that the kind of language that the writers might use around queerness or ident gender identity will kind of remain their own in a sense or of the locale and so there isn't this attempt to define to consolidate to um uh, analytically categorize but rather to to offer um you know this kind of juxtaposition and there's there's something about you know each of these kind of ordinary moments or at least for queers perhaps ordinary spaces or recognizable spaces um, and the attention of them, no, no matter how minor, you know, some of them are, are are very minor spaces or minor architectures or minor moments, but they're given kind of the same space as a Bavarian king or as, you know, a really well-researched or well-resourced um, uh, museum or, or you know, or the Bishop's Case Institute, which has its own issues and, and you know, and histories. But there, there's a kind of also a pacing of equivalence that the kind of design and format offers so that we do have these kind of zoom in, zoom outs, but it, I don't know, it, 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 it does something to the ways in which we might normally theorize or think or, or, or categorize spaces, you know, by scale or by function or by, you know, um, historical impact, because of course, uh, all those things are precisely what you're questioning. Um, or part of what you might be questioning in, in this kind of project. So yeah, I started in a process of reading page by page, and I ended in a process of just radically flipping, moving, going back, dog earing, marking, and and all of a sudden, you know, some of that coming togetherness, some of that juxtaposition work that you want to have happen, I suppose, as an editor, you know, the way you've done it, it, it happens. Um, it happens in the way you've curated it, but I think it will also happen in the way that people come to curate it for themselves. It's, you know, a point I was sort of trying to make to someone recently who wanted, you know, those definitions. I was saying that um, there's nothing stopping people. Pe everyone always wants boundaries. Everybody always wants borders. Everybody always wants definitions. And we are not criticizing that. We're not foreclosing that. If anything, we're providing more of a possibility because we're putting material out there that allows people to draw their own definitions, conclusions, categories, <laughs> you know, let a thousand categorizations of queer space bloom. So, so we were constantly discussing types of spaces, categories, like ways that spaces that can be queer, but that's sort of hidden in the um, in the subtext that of us as editors and what we chose or like what we included. Um, but we really were as, as careful as we possibly could be because obviously it's methodologically impossible to avoid having your authorial stamp in some way on it. Our names are on the front. But as much as possible, we wouldn't, didn't want to turn it into this sort of formulate definition that could then turn it into an ism, which students could then use and, you know, which by you know by mistake would happen to get us good positions somewhere and forever have our names associated with them so there was also i guess a slightly negative thing we were, <laughs> we were trying to stay away from that helped the positive nature of what we uh, that kind of the new framework that we set up that guided how we populated the book It requires an eco yeah, it requires an ecosystem, but that ecosystem is also generated. Um, so I guess it requires an ecosystem for a queer space to survive or continue or to grow. Um,
and very often these happen or almost always these have happened in the inter interstices and the gaps between um you know all of the the spaces that a paternalistic society have created for communal celebration or communal enjoyment or even privacy so you know for and especially for working class queers so for wealthy queers there was the opportunity to create private domains and worlds which are somewhat out of the view uh, of the public um you know the cottage on a um the kind of mediterranean villa and the collections within or just the domestic interior um are you know the most notable notable examples um and later on with certain nightclubs but you know for for people without that kind of wealth they would manage to inhabit the gaps between you know so whether it was uh, public spaces which are right in the middle of the city but at different times of the day or at night they would occupy them all buildings uh, that were normally used like cinemas but they would just happen to have the right types of spaces around the edges that were dark enough that would allow people to congregate while there was enough noise that things that were being done couldn't be heard by the rest of the audience these places have always been adopted um and I think they can probably count as refuge in the same way that these private spaces of the wealthier were very obvious refuges. But um, those who didn't have those homes would find them in the most unexpected of places right in the heart of the city. And I think a really, for me, really nice thing that always happens is that queers, gays, queers have always um, co-opted or um, re fashioned the meanings of the symbols of the states which very often oppress them so we have the lenin museum uh in the book we have um the santiago apostol cathedral in managua and we have um a copelia ice cream parlor uh in uh, havana and these were all you know state uh or in the case of Russia, state religion, uh, or okay, communism as a religion, because then in the figurehead, uh, or actual state symbols of states which were very antagonistic towards queers, and yet those symbols were taken over. Um, and this this sort of refashioning of space through appropriation, this sort of undermining of symbols of power, uh, for me is sort of like I guess sitting on the top of the cake of those of that particular approach or ways of occupying spaces, it's, uh, the, the unexpected spaces. Um, so I love that inversion of symbolism that happens very, very often. But yeah, so refuge, I think refuge occurs always just in different forms. There's also a really great, um, just building off of that, I mean, maybe like a more familiar site of appropriation, you know, the kind of some of the natural sites that you have, the cruising sites, the bathhouse. But I was thinking just as you were speaking um, and, your, and your question too, around the um the caminito verde in mexico city which is this kind of green walk through uh unam so the national museum in in the southwest of mexico city and um and what's beautiful about that is is not just that it's a, another outdoor cruising site um and not just that it's at the center of the national uh university but also a line at the end which is that because it isn't tied to one site it's also nomadic and so as it's being shut down it's regrown and there's just a line i want to quote which is um it's a nomadic site it's a public place of intimacy a space for flourishing leads to its inevitable demise and yet whose downfall always leads to its re-emergence in a perpetual and seamless loop of use discovery institutional annihilation and pleasurable regrowth and that last word, I just I made a note of that pleasurable regrowth, which you know sits inside this language of like I don't know the bursting of kind of leaves and and the kind of density of the kind of images that you have in that site, but also this question of you know you're speaking to earlier, Adam, that you know queerness is is arrived to uh, one might be born through and of it or in it. There's different ways one can talk about coming into it, but also that it, it's arrived at. And so there's, there is this strange, you know, that pleasurable regrowth, just also of queerness as a, as a site and a space of experience. I thought was so well captured in that example. And also a way in which I think responding to that question of, you know, appropriation of the continual kind of, you know, fighting to, to be seen, but also to hide this question of, you know, exposure and refuge, which sits, you know, as the paradox and crux of queer life. Um, but that notion of just just there's hope in that notion of kind of annihilation and and not just regrowth but pleasurable regrowth. Uh, that's 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 a beautiful phrase and something that I, 
that case offers, but it's kind of, it's all throughout there, you know? And so I just thought there's this, there's a, there's this kind of, even within the queer community, this question of kind of annihilation and, and this requirement of pleasurable regrowth, which some of these, you know, black, lesbian and gay centers, the youth center, some of these more, let's say, functional or community oriented sites that are, I think, often less exciting to be put into an, an anthology than a radically aesthetic something or some incredible um, historical um, e example that we haven't heard of. But these more kind of ordinary, mundane struggles um, that are also in here um, and trying to think about those as sites also of pleasurable regrowth just sat with me and, and the way in which they're kind of populated throughout here. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and that's that's also something that we, in terms of the, the selection and the organization, um, we really did want to sort of, it's not only about, I guess, bringing the coalition together within a book, architecturally, by the Rainbow Coalition, um, but also bringing together things that are very often fragmented and seen as incommensurate um so you know a super commercial butch gay bar in tokyo which is like you know lots of alpha gays <laughs> um next to like you know radical community group in wanoka in, in uh, nicaragua that's all about survival and life yeah you know they're bringing together the sort of i guess it's not necessarily it's very often anti-capitalist um you know people People look at different ways of people who are looking at different ways of organizing life, existence, family, survival, education, income, but together with those which very often are seen as their polar opposite. And for us, it was this sort of act of just forcing them together mm. was quite important to us because they're very often separated. But there, I, you know, I do. These are unbelievably dark times, and they're getting darker. And there was like a 15 year period where things looked like they were getting much better, but they're going backwards now. And I do feel like we need as a broader coalition to really stand together on everything. And so just in a tiny little way <laughs> that influenced the, the decision to include these sort of uh, almost antagonistic types of spaces. I mean, just building off that, you know, I was even thinking of the, I know I mentioned it earlier, the Hidra Guru Ma's house, or these kind of spaces where there's also kind of um, intergenerational but quasi-domestic relations of education, support, skill sharing. But I think what's really important is that the book, outside of, I think, the one queer space course from Ed Soja, uh, which is kind of featured, there, it really doesn't feature the work of institutionalized educational sites and spaces. And in fact, tries to shift and, and highlight those spaces that operate despite of or in spite of um, some of those other sites and spaces that we might most normatively or normally think education resides. Um, and you know, for the reason that Adam mentioned, but I'm sure many of us in the queer community and, and uh, those coming through these spaces, um, even today, continually um, see a kind of um, a confrontation either with identity of themselves in terms of personal safety or, or relationality, but also in terms of the topics we're allowed to speak about, talk about, even teach sometimes. Um, and so, uh, and that comes through not only in how one feels in a space, but how funding happens in universities, how research is funded, how publications happen, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a relatively conservative site still, despite, you know, all the contributors here the the spaces that uh adam and joshua are carving out and, and colleagues as well and the the incredible conversations that students are having on their own in students unions uh in 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 debates and, and societies and their own work pushing through so it's almost like it's still today you know it's reminiscent of, of maybe adam's story uh this kind of per perseverance in spite of um but what's so beautiful about the examples the, the motricellus and others is that there, there are these alternative pedagogies, alternative hierarchies, alternative ways of organizing the way that education happens. Um, and I think that's some learning that, that institutions need to reflect on and, and, and shift and change. I think so, something that I probably need to mention is that there was a very delicate balancing act to be had with the book. And I think in general, there's a very delicate balancing act to be had when discussing spaces outside of New York and London mostly like major cities um even 
in other parts of our country um, because we're in a very unusual and historically rare moment of visibility um, and to a degree acceptance uh, legally as well as socially in certain countries. Um, and in some of those, like in America, it looks like it's moving backwards again. Um, but actually in the majority of the world, it's not exactly the same at all. There's a lot of varying situations. Um, and in a lot of places, um, the, the, the point of refuge and protection and privacy is incredibly loaded to the point where it can be the matter, it can be a matter of life and death in some places, or in other places, it can be a matter of being able to exist in society or not being able to exist in society anymore. Um, and we found that, you know, we couldn't publish a lot of things. There's very significant entries that we absolutely wanted to have um, that on the one hand, we couldn't have because um, we want mostly as much as possible to work with people who are from the places that they were writing about. And that made it uh, not necessarily safe for them to be published by a book by the RIBA that's going to be internationally available. But then also, if it's a contemporary space, it's not safe for them. So even with some of the ones that we have in the book, there was up until the, literally the very last moment, I felt sick in the stomach, as did other people in the project, worrying about were we making them unsafe. Um, and, you know, while Hotel Gondolin is very well known in Buenos Aires, I think it just highlights the fact that on the second day of Pride Month, uh, there, you know, Aunt Zoe's room was firebombed. You know, they threw a Molotov cocktail uh, from the street and, and destroyed Aunt Zoe's room. There was an amazing campaign. Within days, they raised, I think, like 100, 200,000 pesos. And it's now been restored. But it just shows you how even in these places, which are the most uplifting in the book, it's all very tenuous. So, you know, on the one hand, it's like really fantastic. And we push so hard. It's very meaningful that it was with the Reba and that there's these spaces in it. But then also on the other hand, I guess, that, you know, people like Betsky saying perhaps this is all just unnecessary now because we're all just you know safe um, and gay but queer spaces are not necessary anymore is a very very um, a sort of narrow understanding of queer life around the world and also of our situation in our societies not being a teleological march towards everyone be accepted but actually a constant fight to preserve progress made and to move further on but there were certain things i really wanted to have on the indian subcontinent but we had difficulty getting people who would be willing to to uh, write about it publicly something that we didn't get to include because we felt it was a very western phenomenon but is very interesting uh, is retirement communities which is something that um, has become more prominent in holland and United States and the UK uh, of because it's part, part of the fact that we don't have a ethnic group part of the fact that a lot of the time we don't have families like grouping together and pooling financial resources to create a place to retire uh, is something that is now sort of becoming quite prominent we did we didn't include that though because we did feel like it was sort of uh, focused in in sort of one region of of the world but um, otherwise I think the most possibly the most interesting thing is that um, multi-generational spaces tended to be those which were about creating a family um a sort of a, a place for people who had been uh let, rendered homeless and had to go elsewhere that they create for themselves so these these community centers places like hotel gondolin um they they tended to include people of all age groups with a high not a hierarchy of sort of power but like a hierarchy of support with the elders taking care of the youngest who just recently arrived and then those moving up. So sort of alternative family structures tended to include all, all age groups. Otherwise there is quite a preponderance of, of youngsters in a lot of the nightclubs. <laughs> um, and re I think the reason for that also is that as people experience, uh, or in some cultures, people experience queer spaces. When they're younger, they find their people, they find their partner, and then they manage to become economically successful or secure to a degree. And then they move into a more sort of normal bourgeois life. Um, whereas other people like in, you know, specifically Hotel Gondolin, um, are not able to do that because they are still as trans people excluded from society and they are not able to participate economically to a point where they can live on their own. One of the questions we've received from, uh, especially students is, um, what about digital, uh, queer spaces what about the metaverse 
Um, and, you know, that I think they're, they're really important. Um, I don't think, again, I think Betsky said that the digital would take over from the physical, so it wasn't necessary anymore. I think they're, from what, what, I, what, I, what we have gathered through conversations is that they're complementary. Um, and that, I mean, there's a really nice example, in the, the Closet Yuri Book Club, which is just a lovely entry in, in Bangkok. Um, it's one of the few sort of uh, lesbian and um, gender non-conforming uh, friendly spaces in Bangkok or in Thailand. And um, people there meet online from all over the country. Um, and then to be able to come to meet each other in a safe space physically so that they're not, you know, it's like, you know, they're not catfished or whatever. <laughs> they they go to the Closet Euro Book Club a lot of the time. So there's that complementarity, I think, which happens. Um, the, the book very much focuses on physical spaces. And I think that was uh, that was an intentional uh, thing. Uh, we just decided that there was a lot of research and excitement about digital spaces. Um, whereas there or you know, queer physical spaces, I mean, especially someone who's ever been an addict, which frankly is a very large proportion of the queer community, including me, will know that physical presence is really fucking important. And anybody who's not had a family or lost everything and doesn't have a community knows that physical presence is vital and that you will always gravitate to find it. And that's why these spaces are constantly being reborn. And yes, we're losing the old cis male gay oriented gay spaces of London and New York, but there are new spaces replacing them, um, which are not necessarily the same at all, or they're not nightclubs or they're not sort of drinking places, maybe they're centers, maybe their book uh, bookshops, uh, their cafes. I mean, there's a fantastic radical um, Yiddish radical uh, queer cafe <laughs> just around the corner from uh, Category as Books in Glasgow. Um, you know, these are new spaces that are that are catering for people who need each other to feel safe and to survive and to recognize each other as being worthy of existence. Um, so you know, we felt that the book was hard enough, it was hard enough to edit down what we included with physical spaces. Um, so we, you know, we stuck to those rather than, I guess, watering it down. But it, it, no, it wasn't a comment on, negative comment at all on these digital spaces, but there could be another book by someone else about those. I mean, I would, I think I just echo what Adam said so beautifully, is that these things are complementary in a way. Um, they have been as long as the digital has been around, which is a lot longer than the last five or 10 years of social media. Um, and, and they grow and shift and shape. And I think that's part of the dynamism of that kind of virtual, non-virtual relation. Um, I mean, two things I'm left with from this book um, are, and they're both hopeful, um, which is a wonderful uh, testament to your, to your editing, Adam and, and, and Josh's editing and all the contributors. Um, and the way in which this conversation has been framed, actually, also um, uh, from Stir, is that uh, it, the first reminds me of a quote from from a, a set of colleagues who are writing around kind of queer eco poetics, and they're writing around you know in a lot of questions around climate change and ecology, there's um, a kind of retraction of desire. There's a, a kind of a question that we need to do less. We need to. Uh, uh, um, uh, consume less, we need to kind of retreat, retract, etc. Um, and often that can shift into the language of desire. So there can be a kind of monasticism or a kind of retrenchment from pleasure as well. And there's this beautiful quote from their, their piece in 2018. And it just goes like this. It says, rather than renouncing desire by learning to desire less, we can then learn new ways of imagining and enacting desire. And one of the things a book like this offers us is not only places and spaces, but also a whole atlas, a whole you know, couple hundred pages um, through history, through time of the way in which people have been and always continue to imagine and enact desire otherwise. Um, and it reminds us that you know, queer history isn't just now and, and here, it's, it's all history. It's, it's been everywhere <laughs> and queer places aren't just, uh, you know, here or there, they're everywhere also. And that's, that's something that I'm left with, um, having read this beautiful collection. So just a huge thank you to you, Adam, and, and to Joshua and to all your contributors and everyone who supported you, because I think the life of this book will have and, and what it will offer to all of our communities is, is fundamental.